Hello and welcome back. Uh, we are excited to be joined by family and friends of Joe. Uh, the next hour and a half or so, we will celebrate this incredible man and all of the joy that he brought to our lives. Um, we have a video that we were gonna open up with, but if anyone would like to say anything or start. Say something, should I call in though? No, John, you can, you can speak right from there. All right, should I, can I go now? Yes. Okay, um, I didn't know Joe well, but he did the interview with me for the um, Behind the Silver Screen. He was recovering from sickness at the time and had lost a lot of weight. And uh, so we did it in two separate sections. But the thing I remember best about, about that, and we talked a lot before uh, we, we did the video, are, are his two boys here online with us right now or not? I'm here. And, and, and wave your hand so I can see you. Hi, and, and is your brother here too? I think he'll be joining. He'll be joining. Well, I just wanted to say the thing that impressed me the most, we were talking about my son who's now at Harvard and he said how much he loved his two boys. I mean, he went on about it. And he said, I love it when they call me dad. Every time they call me dad, he said, I just love it. And that's this, uh, I mean, I have many other thoughts about him, but I was crazy about him. I belong to a Magic Castle group of older actors and we meet every other Friday. And he wanted to go in the worst way. And I said, you'll be my first guest when this damn virus blows over. And of course it didn't happen. My, my uh, video, my behind the silver screen was done many months ago. So it just, it never happened. But he wanted to, he, he wanted my, I have an adaptation of Travels with Charlie, the Steinbeck novel as a one man show for me. He wanted that, send it to him. And I also play the piano and he wanted my geniuses at the piano, which is another program that I do. And he sent me then, he said on the inside cover, he said, from one pro to another in his Heart of Hollywood book. And um, we had never talked about his depression. And it just, it was something to read that about how open he was about talking about the depression. Well, you boys, are, are you the person just joined? Are you the other boy, at the son? No. Um, I think you're referring to Randall. That's one of my best friends. So, oh, I see. Okay. Some, some friends. Uh, Joe's brother's here too. We have Joe's Vic, brother. right? Vic, yeah. the older brother. I'm his, I'm his baby brother. Oh, his baby brother. Okay. He used to like to call me his baby brother. <laughs> Even though you're older, right? I'm younger. Oh, no, you I'm are younger. younger. Okay. I'm on and joining us. I'm his brother from another mother, though. <laughs> Oh, I see. I see. Um, that's all. I'm, I'm taking too much time. Uh, and that's all I want to say. Just that my strongest memory was he said, I love it when my boys call me dad. And he repeated it several times. John, it's funny. My, when I'd call up, I'd say dad in such a way that it was almost like a verb. It was like, dad, I got to tell you something. And dad, let's go do something. And it was an action item more than a noun. And it was, it was, uh, was pretty special. I, think, I don't think he talked to anybody for more than five minutes and he didn't tell him about his two boys. So I heard this from everybody. And let me just tell you, we did our best to keep up with him, you know, and give that letter back because he was just remarkable. Yeah, I knew him a little before he was sick because he wasn't terribly well when he did my interview thing. But um, I just loved your dad. I just loved him. So and he, boy, did he love you boys. John, I think on that note, we'll, um, we'll show our opening video and we'll be right back. At one point in my life, I, I had a very successful public relations company. And I woke up one morning and I couldn't get out of bed. I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? I have a beautiful home, beautiful children, but I wasn't happy in my business because I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. 
I wanted to contribute myself, not in my client's self, if that makes any sense. So a friend called me almost the same day and said, hey, you know, you know a lot about the entertainment business. Why don't you do a radio show about Hollywood? And all of a sudden, I was in a studio talking about Hollywood, and my first guest was Jeannie Furstenberg, who was the director of the AFI, and uh, that was 18 years ago, and I've been doing that ever since. And it cost me a lot of money, but it also gave me a lot of years on my life, tons of happiness, contributing to other people's lives and their families' lives. And I'm 78 years old. I feel like I'm 28 years old. And we're just starting doing what we're doing. I wake up with a smile. I go bed to bed with a smile. And I have my problems. Everybody does. But the heck with them. I'm here to do good. Be good, do good, create good. That's it. <laughs> nothing more, nothing less. Hey there, Phil. Hey, Phil. <laughs> Dear Michael and Robin, I never had the pleasure of meeting either of you. Your dad and I met years back at Fairfax High School. I graduated in winter 1957, and Joe had graduated before me. Over these many years, we both found ourselves in the entertainment community. I started in 1963 as a talent agent and in the late 1960s opened up my own personal management company and have since retired. As good fortune would have it, both of us representing talent would cross paths with each other with a certain continuity. It was the same set of circumstances that brought your Uncle Vic and I together with the same common interest. I am a resident of the Motion Picture and Television Fund here in Woodland Hills, California, since March of 2015. I remember as if it were yesterday when Joe and I sat down together, once again breaking bread to talk about a very special group of people with a common interest living in one place. The soul of your dad has put forth on this campus, continues, and so many of us will never forget. We lost a very special person who was always available with his passion for life and living. I am so sorry for your loss and just want both of you to know that your dad was a mensch. I send you both, I send to both of you the same hugs and love that Joe always sent my way. Be well and safe. Fondly, Phil Gittleman. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Beautiful. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. Yes, yes, yes. We have uh, Joyce, Joyce calling in on the phone. Go ahead, Joyce. Hi. Hi. I just want to tell you, I go back 50 years with your dad when he was a personal manager, and he was representing O.C. Smith, and I went to work for Hose's um, agent. It was my first job in the industry. And I remember I learned a lot from him because he was so on top of things. He called every day to find out if there was work for and and what was doing with his record label and he kept us so well informed. So to go back 50 years or more with somebody is such a long time. And uh, I just said love and adoration that he was your dad. And I know he had a marvelous because he was so wonderful with, with the people. On my interview with him, he was so warm and so lovely. 
loving. And uh, when I spoke about my daughter and my grandchildren, he spoke about two boys. And uh, I just send lots of love and condolences and know that your dad was so, so special. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Joyce. Thanks, Thanks Jen. Bye-bye. Michael. Thank you. I, I mean, it, every story is consistent, which is just a testament to him. He just, that was him. He was genuine. He, he, he wasn't one person to someone and something else to someone else. He was always true to himself, and that really was the generosity. I said this uh, about him. He was present. He, he, he gifted you with him focusing on you. He knew how to show up for you, and he was present like the double meaning of the word. That was his gift to you. And um, people recognize that because he didn't bring that luggage in of, oh, I've got other business and other things that are taking priority or that he needed to take care of. When he was with you, he was on you, and he focused on, on making you feel good. Um, a lot of people will say, I don't know what we talked about, but I left there feeling like a million bucks. <laughs> My dad just did that to everybody. He made them feel amazing. And at the end of the day, that's priceless. There's not too many people that make you feel good. Um, Ted, Ted, we have you up next if you want to call. He, he was a great listener. He was just, he just, he, he heard everything and focused on you. To, I mean, he, he was just amazing. He was a wonderful interviewer. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Howard, would you like to speak now? Sure. I'll always talk about Joey. This man and I met around mid-70s, 1976-ish. In 1978, we started running together. And we ran probably most every day. Six o'clock in the morning. We did it until 1998 when I moved out of the area. We have been brothers. Actually, there's Mike and Robbie and Vic and, I'm sorry, I'm with, no, I'll go with Vic then, a little older, okay? I'm his, I'm his mother from another brother. This man always had a smile on his face and always laughed. And Joey would listen and we talked about everything. I mean everything, two of us running in the morning. And, um, I shared so many things with him, I would have never told anybody else, and I'm not the kind of person that shares anything about anything, per se. But he had a way of inviting you to share. He invited you to listen, but he listened to what you had to say. He didn't always have the answers, none of us do, and Joey knew it, but he was just there, and I, I, I see his smiling face. Mike, um, the other day, before Joey left us, uh, was in the hospital, and we did a, um, we did a call, not a Zoom call, but we did a, a, a FaceTime call, and there's Joey in bed, and he's telling me how crappy he feels, but there was the smile. <laughs> and there was the chuckle. And when he said, I got to get off this thing, I can barely move. I said, come on, baby, you're doing fine. But he always did that in the middle of crap. He found the pony in the room. He really did. He knew how to be an optimist in the middle of the crappiest things that hit our lives as human beings. And last night, I was actually listening to something with Simon and Garfunkel, and old friends came on. Oof. And the words resonated. Old friends, old friends, 
sat on their park bench like bookends. And can you imagine us years from today sharing a park bench quietly? And how terribly strange to be 70. <laughs> but a time it was, and what a time it was. It was a time of innocence and a time of confidences. And that's what Joey left for me. And those words resonate so much of who, what my relationship is with Joe. And I, 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 I love his boys. I love his brother, Susan. I've never seen the strength of helping Joey transition. And it was remarkable. I will miss him. He will always be with me. I can talk to him. He can't quite hear what he's saying, but he's always going to be with me, and I will never forget him. And what? And as they say, that was a life well lived. God bless you, Joey. Amen. Amen. And guys, so you know, that's that's my dad's best friend. Really, they they have an unbelievable bond. So I love you, Howard. Love you too, baby. Um, Victor, would you like to? Vic, would you want to say anything now, or do you want to speak a little later, or not so much? Vic, do you say me? Oh, oh, sure. <laughs> uh, let me clear my throat one second. Victor <laughs> Um, The last time I, I'm just going to tell you about the last time I was with my dear, dear brother. I was talking to him and um, telling him again how much I love him and how much I appreciate what he did for me and with me in, in our, my life and our lives. And um, hopefully I'll get to heaven because uh, the last thing I said to Joe was, uh, I'll see you later. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, so what I would like to do is show you guys a, um, oh, here's Ted. Sorry. Hi, Ted. Hi. Hi. I would, I would like to know, I'm sure, I had never met his, his children, but I'm looking at the screen. Can I assume that the upper right hand is one of his sons? Yes. The good-looking kid with the black hair waving the one, at you. The one that just waved to me. Yes. Is there a second son? There is. Um, I don't believe he's with us right now. All right. What happened is, is I, I spoke to Vic yesterday. I had a long talk with him, obviously, and Vic asked me, did I know how long I knew Joe? And I told him I took a guess a few, a few weeks ago. I said 45 years. He said it's 55 years. You were at our house for dinner. 59, Ted. Five years ago. He was quite a guy. He was terrific. He had a great father. He was a very good friend for all of these years. And I hope you're a good kid. Anyway, that's all I have to say. He's a wonderful, he was a wonderful guy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ted. It was amazing. Excuse me, Ted was at dinner at our house on Vista, and uh, my mom, it was my mom and dad and Joey and me. Uh, I'm not sure who else was in the dining room at dinner, I mean, but that was about 59 years ago. Well, anyone who's been a friend of Ted Witzer's for 59 years it definitely is in heaven. So, Vic, you will be too. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Bob. Good one, Good one. Um, hi, Sloan. Hi. I remember. I remember. We we, had, we haven't been here very long, so we didn't know him very well. But but we loved him nevertheless. But um, I remember I was shocked when he said to me, uh, "Would you give me an hour of your time? Could I interview you for an hour?" Well, why would he ever interview me? I'm a non-pro. The only 
I, the only thing I know about show business is through my husband. So I reluctantly said, okay. And the other thing about that was that, you know, I, as I was growing up, I was always told never start a sentence with the word I. And Joe made me forget that just like that. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Well, uh, well, while we have a second, let me tell you something about my dad telling someone not forget, not to forget the word I. There was a gentleman that came into, I think it was MCA Records, and said, "This is my my real and uh, don't don't mind the vocals because I just want you to hear the music. We can put anyone on it." And my dad heard this gentleman's album, and they looked at each other in the room, and they were like, "Well, we want to tell you one thing. We love your music." But if you're going to consider anybody singing this other than you, we don't want it. And that person was Barry White. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So he told Barry White not to forget I either. Yes, and that's Barry right. was about to. Very good. <laughs> good advice. We... Um... we we, we have, could take that. We could take that Barry White story in in all kinds of directions, but it probably would be X-rated here. So, <laughs> uh. we have a video um, from this very stage from the five-year anniversary of MPTF 22, where the Musical Theater Guild was um, tasked with creating songs for some of the major players for the the TV station. Um, and everybody knows Heart of Hollywood is not just the name of Joe's book, not just the name of his radio show, but truly was his philosophy, that there was a huge heart in Hollywood, and I think Joe was that heart. Um, so I want to show you this fun video and hopefully give us a little something to laugh about, and when we're done with the video, we'll come back out to Hawk. Hollywood. Joe Sutton is the heart of Hollywood. Not just the ventricles, but kind of, sorta, the left aorta, and also maybe the spleen. When Wells or Hitch had a bird or itch, Tinseltown's appendix was on the scene. The heart of Hollywood. Joe Sutton has the heart of Hollywood. Hollywood. He's got the pancreas of Joseph Cotton. It's gotten rotten. He's got the tongue of Sabu. He's got the kidney of Sylvia Sidney. Betty Davis eyes and her liver too. The lungs of Hollywood. The ears and nose and throat of Hollywood. I'm sure we all remember Kathleen Knowles. He's got her colon, the bladder of Natalie Wood. If you've got Garbo's knees, just go to Joe, because he's the heart of Hollywood. Thank you. I'm going to start with the, with the letter I. <laughs> I met Joe Sutton over 40 years ago. We all hung out at Roxbury Park. And those who know me knows I'll get emotional. It only took about five seconds. <laughs> Where his sons, Michael and Robbie, and my kids, Billy and Emily, played sports. Everybody knew the Suttons. And I got to meet and see the way Joe interacted with all the parents and grandparents and with the kids on the field. I was in awe of the love that he gave to everyone. That smile, you've talked about it. Mm. That smile would light up a room, a house, a park, a temple, a stadium. That's how large his smile was. The only thing bigger than that smile was his heart. All our kids went to high school together and while I didn't see Joe that much during those years, I sure heard about him from my kids. They always talked about what a great dad Joe was. I lost touch with Joe until I started going to the restaurant Pane Vino. 
on Beverly Boulevard because I loved the food and the atmosphere. I found out Joe was a regular there and that made it even better. When I was done with my business lunch, Joe and the owner, Rod Dyer, would be at a table and invite me to hang with them. Now, a lot of people in our lives, when we meet up with them, say something perfunctory like, hey, how you doing? How are the kids? But when I sit with Joe, he would say, how's Billy? What's happening with Emily? How are you doing? You knew he was really interested. He genuinely cared. <laughs> He was one of the first people to understand why I changed my name to Hawk, and he totally supported it. He never called me Howard again. I joined the board of MPTF about 20 years ago, and there he was again, giving everything he had to our organization. There he was again with his generosity and love and that smile. The thing that goes the farthest towards making life worthwhile, costs the least and does the most, is just a pleasant smile. The smile that bubbles from a heart that loves its fellow men will drive away the cloud of gloom and coax the sun again. It's full of worth and goodness too, with many kindless blend. It's worth a million dollars and it doesn't cost a cent. There is no room for sadness when we see a cheery smile. It always has the same good look. It's never out of style. It nerves us on to try again when failure makes us blue. The dimples of encouragement are good for me and you. It pays a higher interest for it is merely lent. It's worth a million dollars and it doesn't cost a cent. The Joe we knew here in life may be gone, but that's only the body that is gone. His soul, that smile, that light is with us now and will always be with us. So my way of honoring Joe and I hope all of you is to be kind and smile. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Well said. Well said, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Would anyone else like to share anything? Share thoughts or a story? Jen, hi, it's Ken. I apologize for being late, but I actually thought this started at four, so Joe would be very upset with me. <laughs> but I have my Joe Sutton costume on. I have my white t-shirt. I don't have a black blazer, so the blue blazer is gonna have to go. It's what he wore every day. I just wanna tell one quick story. <clears throat> I'm in my office at MPTF, and he comes rushing in, and he says, I'm in love. I'm really in love. Susan, hang in there with me. This will, I'll get to the point. So knowing how he felt about Susan, I was a little troubled by this statement. And so I said, Joe, close the door, sit down. Let's talk. What's going on? He said, Ken, I just met this incredible woman. I'm in love. She's vibrant. She, she is full of life. She's got energy. And I'm in love. And I said, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you meet her? What about Susan? And he looked at me and he said, I just interviewed her for Channel 22. She's an actress. I watched her when I was a kid. I fell in love. And I tell that story because that was the first time he said it. And in the 15 following years, he must have said it at least twice a month, if not more, every time he interviewed a resident. He fell in love. And he fell in love for two reasons. One, he loved Hollywood. He loved Hollywood history. And he loved people as Hawk just described, and I'm sure others have already described. He was so caring and so passionate about learning who these people were and giving them their moment in the sun. And he was particularly in love with this first one because she was a reluctant interviewee, did not want to tell her story, didn't think anyone would care about her story, much less listen. And it was Joe's compassion and that freaking charm of his that got her to open up and tell her story. And it was the beginning of what we've come to know as, as behind the silver screen, and he did, what, Jen, 200 of them. 
but at each and every time he would do one, man or woman, didn't matter, didn't matter what status they had in the business, he would come to me and he'd say, God, I just fell in love again. And that's why what you see on screen with Joe at the interviews with the residents is so real and so honest and so necessary to tell their stories because these were not people who were necessarily having stories told about them. The only other thing I would say about Joe is he taught me two things. One is <clears throat> the measure of a man is not his size. It's not how tall he is or how broad his shoulders are. It's about how big his heart is and how honest he can be with those emotions about caring for other people. The second thing he taught me was how to be a really, really good father. And my first encounter with him was watching NFL football with young Robbie and young Michael in their condo. And, and I watched his affection for his boys, which only grew over the time we were together. <laughs> and and it, it really was the role model to which I looked to when I became a father. So those are the things that I take with me as I celebrate my friend every day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Lovely. Ken, love you. My dad was super close with Ken. Any, any, anyone knows my dad's love for Ken was just off the charts. Thanks, Michael. Um, my name is Randall. I guess you can see that there. Um, I've been a friend of the Sutton boys for, um, God, a long time, 30 years now, 30 years. And when I first met, um, when I first met, uh, you know, Mike, Mike and, and Robbie, I, I was just amazed at, uh, just how, how sweet they were. Like they were like the sweetest, nicest guys. And I, it was hard to imagine people that nice. Um, and uh, when I met Joe, when I finally met Joe, which probably, you know, probably a year or so after we first met, I saw where that spirit of, of joy came from. And um, every time I saw Joe, he, he exuded that warmth. And uh, it wasn't just that the smile was amazing and it was that handshake too. I'd get that big, you know, that big high five handshake and a hug. And he'd tell me he loved me, and I told him I, I loved him, and I, and I really did. I, I loved the guy, even though I didn't see him very often. Um, he, he loved his boys so much. Uh, he loved Susan so much. Uh, he loved his brother, too. He loved his brother, uh, Vic. He, taught, he, he, loved, he loved you, Vic, man. He totally loved you, man. You just loved. I mean, the guy was like a giant mush ball of love. I've never seen anything like it, really. It was, it was I've I never seen a man really just exude that, uh, that joy, that exuberance, and that heart to that degree. Um, <clears throat> Joe invited me to um, do an interview with him. Right after, I, I, I'm an actor, and I had a nice little part in As Good As It Gets. And uh, I thought I could get from Santa Monica to Pasadena, where his studio was, in, you know, 50 minutes. But when, when I got out there, it, it, it was a, a tremendous traffic. It would have taken me, you know, probably seven hours to get out there. There was standstill traffic. And I, I was freaking out. You know, I, 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 I was like, so I called Joe. And I said, Joe, I'm, I, there's no way I'm going to get there. I, I can't get there in, in, in you know 50 minutes. I'm, you know, it's this wall-to-wall -wall traffic. He said, Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the thing. It's all good, man. And we've been talking about this interview for a long time. Uh, and, and so I actually got in the um, uh, what do you call it? You know, on the side of the road. I had never done this before, but I just I didn't want to be. Joe was so cool. I, I still wanted to get there, and so I, I was in the, the, the aisle, you know, where the, where the cops go. The shoulder. Cruising, shoulder. and... Uh, the shoulder. I was in the shoulder, thank you so much. I was in the shoulder. And uh, so uh, four or five o'clock hits, the interview starts, and, and Joe puts me on, on the phone, and I'm literally maybe 10 minutes away at this point. I've just passed all this traffic. And uh, we had an incredible interview. I finally make it to the studio. I was sweating. He was like, it's all good. Everything's good. And uh, 
he he said that you know he really he was adamant about the fact that I I, I should have uh, been nominated for an Academy Award <laughs> for this part. Um, I said, come on, Joe, you know. It wasn't a very big part, but he said, it was a great part. You were amazing in it. You really deserved a, 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 a nod. You should have been nominated for an Oscar. So that was just, you know, he made me feel amazing. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, uh, Joe, uh, I'm doing, I, I, I have a, a hair product company, and I asked Joe if he would be uh, one of my models for for a little spot I, I wanted to do uh, for the for the product, and he said, "Sure, man, anytime, come on by." So I went by the house, and Joe uh, was incredible. He he was game to have me put my my product in, in his hair, and he did it a few times. And then when I got home, I realized that we didn't have every shot we needed. I was like, "Oh my god, Joe!" I, I called him up. I said, "Joe." You're gonna kill me. I I didn't get every shot I needed. He goes, "Don't worry about it, sweetheart. Come on by anytime you want. Come on by tomorrow. Come on by." I said, "You sure, Joe?" He's like, "Absolutely, kid." So came by. He was so cool, and that was he was always like that. He just everything just rolled right off his shoulder. It was pure joy, pure love, and uh, you know I'm really gonna miss him. He really was one of a kind sweetest nicest kindest man uh i, I really I, I have so much love for him and for the whole sutton family um and uh his family and friends he really is a, a gem of a human being as we all know and he will be sorely missed but never forgotten so awesome. rb thank you brother um, love for you. my dad love you jennifer Best. Can I tell everybody something about Randall? I um, I heard somewhere that <clears throat> Helen Hunt, excuse me, I don't know what's going on here. Hold on. <clears throat> that Helen Hunt said that Randall was the best kisser in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> now, now, you, now you tell him. Now you tell me. <laughs> um, we have Frank on the phone. Yeah, I, uh, I, I met your father about uh, 12 years ago. Um, I was going to be interviewed, and uh, I was a re just became a resident here. And I was very nervous because I really had, I was thinking, I don't have a lot to say. You know, I don't know about uh, what I'm going to say to him, how he's going to do this. And so I, I get there, and the very first thing he says to me, you had three holes in one, and I thought, yeah, and it just made me re relax so much, and then he went into all this other things, and he was just a wonderful person, and I, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm sure it's a tremendous loss to you, and I know it is to me, because he was always such a kind person every time I saw him, and I, I, God bless him, and I wish him, you and the family, nothing but the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for calling in. Jen? Jen? Go ahead, Bob. It's Bob. Can I say a few words now? Yeah. 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 So uh, as, as we uh, roll into the uh, end of the week and the Jewish Sabbath, uh, there's a, a parable from the Jewish liturgy I think it's repeated in other religions as well. It's called the parable of the long spoons. I don't know any, if anyone uh, knows this, but uh, the story goes that a Jewish gentleman dies and uh, he's greeted and he's uh, taken into a big banquet hall and uh, he sees table after table, bowls of the most beautiful looking and delicious smelling food and in each bowl there's a, a long spoon it's two feet long uh, and he sees surrounding in the banquet hall all of these people who are wasting away um, they're gaunt and uh, they're hollow cheeked because they can't feed themselves because the spoons are so long 
and that's hell. He's then taken into another very similar room, same size, food, all that, same two feet long spoons, and everyone there is joyful and well fed, and they're feeding each other with the long spoons. Mm. And, and I think that for me, if, if, if we all want to look for the meaning in the grief we feel about Joe dying, it's that he's the person who understands feeding each other with the long spoon. He's nourished everyone who's spoken uh, here this afternoon. He's nourished everyone with his with his big part, his joy. He understood that Hollywood, at its heart, was a community. It was a community. It had a heartbeat. Uh, Joe's heart was uh, the biggest in our community. But but it is a community, and we all need to to nourish each other and enjoy each other's company. No one enjoyed people's company more than Joe, and I, I can't think of anyone whose company I enjoyed more than Joe's. Um, Paul mentioned Pane Vino. I, I knew I knew Joe without knowing Joe for years because I used to go to Pane Vino and I'd see this guy uh, and big smile, always wearing the same thing very dapper uh, and always sitting at the table with Rod and Billy D. Williams and others. This guy's got to be someone. I mean, <laughs> he, you know, he's at the king's table. Uh, and I always wondered, well, so who, you know, who is this guy? And then years later at MPT, MPTF, I got to know him and got my own soul nourished by, by Joe. And, uh, you know, to, to what everyone else has said, uh, getting into a conversation with him was just one of, it was like immersing yourself in a warm tub of water. Uh, it was just uh, a delight and he got you to think about things that you never thought about. He got you to talk about things that you never thought, you know, hey, I'm going to have a conversation. This is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, he just felt made you feel safe and comfortable and, and loved and protected. And I'm guessing, Vic, he did that for you as a as a big brother and Michael, you know, as, as the, and Robbie as a son and Susan. Uh, you know, he was just a, a very very special guy. And uh, you know, I'd like to think that you know all of our grief in the end has some meaning and. For me, that meaning is, you know, the community that Joe uh, drew us all into and was so much a part of. And Joe won't be part of it, but that community, I hope, will sustain itself forever. Yeah, that's awesome, Bob. Thank you. Excuse me, may I say something? <clears throat> um, I was talking to Ted Witzer the other day. Uh, somehow I got a message that he wanted to speak with me. And like we know, I've known him since I was a kid through my brother. And uh, one of the most, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Bob, one of the most important things he said to me besides talking to me uh, directly about my brother and his love for him was that um, when um, you were on the uh, community television, letting everybody know uh, about my brother's passing. Um, Ted made sure that I knew that you had tears in your eyes. Yeah. 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 Um, as, I, as, I, yeah as I wrote to you, Vic, I mean, we're, we're, we, you know, sadness is just so pervasive these days in, in, in our world where we're all grieving about either people we've lost from COVID or the world that we've lost from COVID. And, you know, what's this new world going to be like when, when it changes again? And when you lose someone like Joe, that sadness just wells up in really unexpected ways. Thank you. But it shows your beauty, too. Thank you. Um, we have Toby on the phone, and then I think Christina wants to speak as well. But let's hear from Toby. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, we met in the year 2014. I did a, a, a behind the silver screen with uh, Joe, and I was very nervous because 
I wasn't in the industry, it was my husband. And he told me before we went on, uh, before the taping, that uh, uh, just relax and uh, talk about your husband, you know, and stuff like that. And he just made me feel so warm and comfortable. We did talk about being in Brooklyn. And uh, I told him that my brother graduated from Fairfax High when we came out here. And um, I wanted to read a little poem that I said to, uh, at my husband's uh, memorial. It's a short one. God saw you were getting tired and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come with me. With tearful eyes, we watched you fight and saw you fade away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating, working hands were put to rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us he only takes the best. And I just wanted to say, I know he's up in heaven with the good people. And uh, you all have my uh, deepest sympathy. He was a wonderful man. Goodbye. Thank you. That was beautiful. Beautiful poem. If you'll excuse me for a minute, Bernstein, I'm going to have to leave because it's pre-Shabbat and I've got to do another thing that I'm involved in in my life. And, and Joey is with her right now. Um, I look forward to the time when we are going to sit down together, not on a Zoom call, but around something where we can hoist a drink to Joey. And we'll talk about him some more, and he'll be there with us. And everybody has said such beautiful things about this guy that um, it is fantastic. And I thank you all for sharing it with me. I really do appreciate it. I love you all. Guys, take care of yourself. Howard, please read a note I just sent you. I, I, I want to say one more thing, if I might. Um, I hope all of you can see Michael Sutton because that smile of Joe's uh, <laughs> has been there all day long. And <laughs> it is just, it, it's, it's so hot, heartwarming just to have seen him since he was a little kid when my daughter was hey. <laughs> Joey, taught him. <laughs> Joey taught him everything there's there come on <laughs> Billy Cott <laughs> thank you all didn't hear you Michael Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom Howard thank you very much thank you thank um, you both. Christina had wanted to share something Christina are you are you on uh, the line? Here I am. Um, I've known him a very long time, and he was like in and out of your lives. And it was such a joy. He, he, I, he, I knew him when I was a singer, I knew him when I was an actress, all these things, and he, every time you would see him or be with him or get a hug from him, smile from him, it was like, oh, that's so nice. I really have to have more of that. And I came here and got interviewed by him, and he insisted that he did not interview people. He had conversations with them. And he, he just, he got me to talk about things and say things that, you know, I've got a pretty wild mouth anyhow, but he was, made me so very happy. Um, he asked me one day after I got here about my sons, because he knew I had a couple of boys. And he said, I have a couple of boys. And I said, well, one of the reasons I came here was that I lost my son, Michael. And I just couldn't be where he was. And when I told him that my son, Michael, had died just like a year before, he hugged me with a hug that I've never had before. And it was like I, he looked at me like I kicked him in the stomach. And he gave me the best hug anybody could ever get in their life. 
and he always managed to make me feel not the loss of my son, but the joy of my son, because he was about the best there was, and he let me tell him stories about things that Michael had done. Um, and I just, I really wish I could have one more hug and one more conversation. And no, I hope Michael finds him because Michael's a talker just like me. Um, and I just, I needed to say that he was so wonderful and so kind to me. When I went to Rogers and Cowan, I knew nothing about public relations, but he was always at the places that I was. And he would say, well, look at that over there, I bet. And he would tell me who people were, and he, he really helped me through not getting yelled at by Warren Cowan. Um, but I, I just wanted to say I've never been hugged by anybody, and I feel could feel it in my heart. Well, to quote, so, thank to you quote very Joe, much. Christina, to quote Joe, how lucky are we? <laughs> um, right? How lucky are we that you got that hug, that we had those oh conversations? Gosh, yes. And it, I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget his smile and telling me so much. But the fact that my kid had died was just something he couldn't comprehend. Mm. Losing your child. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, and I'll miss him so much. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Sorry for your loss. My dad will find him, that's for sure. <laughs> My dad will find him. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, yes, he wants that smile. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, had, he knew how to give back, he knew. So. Um, he was special. He did that to all of my friends. He did that to all of my brother's friends. What you're talking about, he just had that gift. So. Hey, Michael, one of the great words he always used was magic. That was magic. We just made magic. We're going to make magic. Yeah. And that's the, that's the definition of magic, what we just listened to. Yeah. yeah. You're right, Ken. He helped me so much. Hey, Michael. Uh, can you tell them this, the, these lovely people the story you told me about your dad? I think it was about ten days ago. I can remind you a little bit if you if you're not if you don't know what I mean. Please. Uh, there was some of your friends who had wonderful, wonderful, wonderful relationships with their father. Hawk, excuse me for this. And some who had good relationships with their father, and some who had not so good relationships with their father. And then you told me what you went on to say, what I think I should let you say if you remember now. I, I basically was, you know, telling uh, my Uncle Vic that there's never enough time and enough moments. And even though I had decades with my father, knowing how special he was and building all these memories, and I said that, you know, people can have amazing relationships with their fathers or mothers. And I'm not taking anything away from the beauty that everyone has, but I was trying to connect my uncle to a place that I felt I had reached with my dad that was so above and beyond what could possibly have existed with anybody else just because of the man who gave it to me. I was aware for so many decades the, the, the connection or the covenant that he was asking me to accept into and my brother and I did that early early on and um, to know how special someone is for so many decades as they're your mentor and your teacher and your your everything you know we had said uh, my, my dad is it it's just meaning whatever word you think needs to fit in that place he was that he is that uh, so I just said that I had probably the greatest um, human experience that God could have placed on this earth with that man. And um, it's the truth. It was, it was nothing's perfection, but it was as close to. 
So that's the story I told Uncle Big. I'm so jealous. <laughs> so very jealous. Um, that's so much. Can I say something? I'm Michael's aunt. I'm I'm Joey's younger sister. Mm-hmm. And Joey gave a lot of love to so many people. The most love he gave was to his sons. But the proudest thing I am is that the love he gave his sons is the love he got back from them. And that's the greatest gift any parent can get from their child. So you gave him, Michael, as much as he gave you. Thanks, Santa Jules. <clears throat> Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Can I speak? Please, Susan. Hi. So I'm Joey call, would call me my Susan or, or Nemo. In fact, one of Michael's friends told me that he referred to me so much as my Susan, they th- thought my first name was my. It was <laughs> so endearing. Um, I want to address a few things that were said that were beautiful today. Ken, I know Joe would come home and tell me he fell in love too. It was so beautiful. Um, interesting enough, I met Joe at Pawnee Vino. <laughs> I worked with Rod Dyer at the time. It was my 40th birthday, and I knew of Joe, and when I decided, yes, I'll have lunch with you. And at that lunch, the way he spoke about his two boys, I knew he was a good man, and I told them this before. I fell in love with Joe, with the relationship with his sons and his family. It was such a beautiful thing, and... This tribute today is really beautiful, and thank you, everybody. It's so nice to hear these words. And I was this recipient of so much of his love. I was a very lucky girl. Yes. And you got lucky too, Susan. He used to ask me, what did I do to be so lucky? And I said, Joe, Joey's Joe Sutton, you're a good man. And that was my, we would do this dialogue on somewhat on a weekly basis. How did I get so lucky? I said, Joey, you're a good man. And he was. <clears throat> well, there was a great debate about how you guys met, right? No, it's not <laughs> where. It was my birthday. And there was, right. You know, there's, there's two versions of the story that we've heard, some of us have heard multiple times. I, I would love to a glass of champagne involved. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to speak? Um, I, I had the great privilege of knowing Joe for over 15 years, but working really closely with him for the past 15 years on the TV station. And um, yes, my Susan, he <laughs> adored you and um, could not speak highly enough about his sons, but would also be quick to share with me, um, who was uh, lovelorn for a long time, um, that you know it it will happen and he knew he knew he he never lost faith that i would find uh true love and uh edgar's with us today and we had a commitment ceremony because covid took our wedding um but joe talked about that moment at ponivino where he looked across the restaurant and you were sitting there alone Right? That his story was you got stood up. I had girlfriends in front of me. All right. (laughs) Well, his version of it was that, and it it made him um, whether it made him feel or whether he wanted you to know that he felt like he was your white knight, that he um, he took that moment and wasn't going to let it pass by, and he was really extraordinarily proud of that because of his deep love for you. I love that version. I love that. <laughs> um, we have a couple of other short video pieces. Uh, one of the residents asked that we show a moment from Joe's interview with her because uh, it goes very much in hand in hand with what I just said about Joe's, the way Joe presented himself and felt about himself. Um, out of her 45 minute interview, this is the moment that Shirley loved and treasured the most and it's not about her. So 
um, let's share that and we will um, we'll be right back what haven't we talked about that you'd like to talk about? Your football star days. <laughs> My, uh, uh, <laughs> I was, I was, we played, I, actually I played at Valley College and we went to the Junior Rose Bowl and I played quarterback there. I was not the first string quarterback, but I played, I was second string, I shared playing with the you know, me and another kid. When you were six foot two and weighed two hundred and twenty pounds. When I was six foot two and weighed two hundred and twenty pounds. <laughs> but that's when you're as small as I am. That's how you have to think. I used to feel sorry for big guys. <laughs> I did. I got them scared of me because if they weren't scared of me, they could have killed me. <laughs> you are a joy, and you're as pretty as a picture, and your eyes are shining. And I hope you had as good a time as I, I had. A wonderful time. God bless you, Shirley. Shirley Cohen. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Ain't we lucky? Behind the silver screen, MPT, uh, we live and we work and we enjoy a great facility in this magic community. We're the only industry in the world that takes care of our own people. And we're part of it, kid. God bless you always, and Shirley. And you too, Joe. Thanks I'm for Joe doing. Sutton. See you soon. Shirley Cohen. Pretty as a picture. You know, um, may I just say, just speaking of the interview thing, he opened up our interview with, um, I am thrilled to be chatting with John, uh, who is an actor on stage and screen, Broadway, off Broadway. He went, I was like, who are you talking about, Joe? <laughs> you know, and, um, and then I tried to get, and he did a little bit talk about it. I took care of a wife with Alzheimer's for 10 years. And I said, I heard you took care of your wife. He said, no, this interview is about you, John. It's not about me. I said, but you went through that, Joe, didn't you? And then he started to talk about how seven rough months, she had brain surgery. She said, now she's uh, back at work half day. She swims. He said, I lost 30 pounds. I've gained a lot of it back. And I, because we I was talking about uh, losing um what's the but when you lose your can't think of the word anyway he said but i've gained that back now too and so i got him to talk about about himself but he was still quite he was still quite underweight at the time but he did talk about himself <laughs> so i'm thrilled to be chatting <laughs> what are you talking about joe <laughs> You know, they talk about it doesn't matter the sex. I fell in love with him. He fell in love with me. And was he, he said, now, I promise you're going to take me to the Magic Castle. I said, absolutely. You're top of the list when, the, when all this damn thing blows over, you know. And then I, I can't tell you how devastated I was when I heard that he had passed. I, just, I didn't know he was back and that's sick again anyway anyway i'm just tossing in something else there for nothing um would anyone else like to share i'll share again uh i started uh volunteering and working there at channel 22 from the beginning uh and that was the pleasure of, of watching him work and interview people. It was a joy to watch, a joy to film, and uh, getting the uh, the camera on him, the close up on him. The thing that I learned is how he listened. He was an amazing mm -hmm. listener, and he held on to your every word, and he made you feel special. And uh, and had great follow-up questions. He wouldn't let him go. He was a he was a very good interviewee, in, interviewer, and I learned a lot from that. I, I was telling Jen about this the other night that maybe subconsciously I, I picked up a lot of his style when I do the interviews that I do um, on my own. And uh, the smile was always there, uh, but I loved his listening. Uh, and you can see it in his reactions and his face. And I love being a close up of the camera and to see that his reactions uh, to people and uh, 
and his expressions. Uh, it was just it was just wonderful to watch, and I and I feel privileged to have experienced it, and I'm going to miss him very much. You know, I've I've watched a couple of yours, Edgar, your interviews, and you've really picked up the mantle because you are also a very good listener. You know the questions to ask. You're very good. Thank you. Thank you, John. But like I said, I really, it's all those years watching Joe, I, I, I can't think of, it any, of anything else. I mean, I do watch a lot of movies, but uh, I had never interviewed people before. And uh, I know that Joe had a lot to do with it, just watching him work. And it was, it was fun, and it was a privilege. Did Joe ever uh, look at you, Edgar, and, and you, Jen, and kind of go, have you guys met? You guys been working together for 15 years? What's going on? <laughs> uh, like I, I, I told this story that um, I know how how much Joe loved Jen and treated her like his daughter. The daughter. And um, it never came to that, but seeing the love that he had with her, it just, you felt it. You felt it, and uh, no, the answer is no, he never said that, Hawk, but I've had many friends since just slap me upside the head and just say, what took you so long? <laughs> and uh, and I don't have an, a good answer for it, but I'm glad that I finally figured it out, and I, I couldn't be happier. Joe was thrilled when I finally fessed up that he was right the whole time. It was hot dog. <laughs> Sorry, um, Bob is on the phone. Hi, Bob. Mute your TV. Hi. Hi. Okay. I wasn't really planning on calling in. A bunch of you people there know this story, but I don't know that Joe's family does. Joe was pivotal in my life. Um, I did interviews for him for Channel 22 for several years. And in the process of that, I interviewed another resident here. I fell deeply in love with her and she with me. She also had Alzheimer's as was mentioned. And um, So when I interviewed her and I gave the notes to Joe and he was scheduled, he scheduled her, uh, her interview, I took her to the, uh, to the stage and, and sitting by her, she was very nervous. She was not uh, a performer. Her husband was a writer in the industry. And just before she was ready to go on, she said, I can't do this. I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do it. And I said, honey, we've been scheduling this. The people are around. I think you should do it. I said, you're going to be very, very comfortable with this man. He's, it's just going to be a conversation. And she said, I'll do it for you. And she went up, and she had the most beautiful interview, and she glowed, and she was gorgeous and her smile was hypnotic and she finished the interview and uh she was so so happy and she came down the stairs and i ran up to her and i threw my arms around her and i gave her this big kiss which i had never done before and i said to her words that just i can't i can't believe I said it, but I did. I said, you know, you're the first blonde and the first Gentile I ever kissed. And we, we were together for years after that, and we had a commitment ceremony that Bob performed and that Jen had recorded and that I watched frequently when I'm feeling strong enough to watch it. And it it perpetuated our love until the day she died. And I'm forever grateful for him for having done that. Thank you. God bless you all. 
Thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, there, there wasn't a person that Joe interviewed who didn't walk out of that interview either glowing or a few inches taller um, or with, you know, a, a much broader smile than what they had coming in. He, he touched so many people's lives and also had a true understanding that he wasn't just making an impact on that person for that half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour, but this was a living legacy for their family and for people to know about the industry forever. Mm -hmm. interviewed me one time when somebody didn't show up so we had no notes although we had talked over a period of time because I was on the camera crew many times but sometimes just a set dresser and what he did for me was create something that I can share with my children and my grandchildren about my history in the motion picture and television industry. But he he was just absolutely wonderful with all the people that he interviewed. And I hung on every word that came out of his mouth, let alone what came out of the mouth of the interviewee. Anyway, I really, when I heard about his passing, um, it really hit me deeply and the one thing we both had in common was our gray hair. <laughs> and your great smile, Ben. Anyway, he was terrific. Michael, is there anything else that you would like to say before we play some of Joe's favorite songs and show our last video piece? I think the songs are going to be great. I, I just, you know, my dad was so full of life, so... One of the things that he just wants everybody to do is live life and love everybody. And I think if we emulate him and kind of put into practice what he was really all about and continue his legacy, this world's gonna be a better place. And I just wanna thank everyone for sharing um, from the bottom of my heart, you know? And uh, just know that we were around someone pretty amazing and pretty special and you know, thank you and love to all of you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So I think what we'll do is we'll show the video clip first, and then um, we're going to play some Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and show you some of Joe's pictures. But the video clip is six minutes, so settle in, enjoy this, and then um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Jen, for putting this on. Thank you. picture television fun Joe Sutton the heart of Hollywood behind the silver screen oh my gosh Jennifer 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 Clymer Ken Shearer all the people we've chatted with talked about their lives about talked about their lives with brought tears to people's eyes brings tears to my eyes I love the people I love the people that live here. I love the people that work here. I love the crew on this show right now. I love Jennifer Clymer. I don't know if she's my muse or my daughter or whatever she is, but the miraculousness of this channel, Channel 22, is because of her principally. I have so much fun out here. I get in a good mood driving out here. Sometimes I'm exhausted when I leave, but I always have a smile on my face because what we do is good what hollywood is the heart of this town is so good is so pure and when i hear people 
denigrate it or talk without respect about Hollywood. That's why I do what I do, because there are so many beautiful people, so many hearts, and MPTF characterizes all of it. The love, the respect, the language, the industry. It's love, L-O-V-E, M-P-T-F. Same thing, different letters, same thing, love, beautiful people. The Golden Boot Awards. <laughs> we used to honor the cowboys. And when I was a kid, we used to go to the movies on Saturday afternoon and you'd wear your cap guns, your two six shooters, and you'd go to the hitching post. We went to the hitching post on Wilcox and Hollywood Boulevard. And they actually had a hitching post, like a, where, the, where you put their horse stirrups or whatever around and you had to put your cap guns on this thing and go in watch the movie then come out and get your cap guns so i loved i loved the the golden boot awards and i get them i got to meet so many of my idols lash larue i met oh my gosh i can't even roy rogers i met um the motion picture television fund it it's it reflects everything it reflects tarzan Johnny Weissmiller lived out here on this campus. Uh, I, I just can't describe it. It's amazing. But the, the Golden Boot Award introduced me to the Motion Picture Fund. Ken Shearer, who is the CEO of the foundation, brought me in to help with public relations at the time. And it's grown into this with what we do on Channel 22. So it's, it's what I do. It's what motivates me. It what's, it's what gives me joy in my heart. And uh, I walk around the campus and I just, I'm in love with everybody. Do you fall in love every time that you interview somebody? I fall in love every time I interview somebody. How can you not fall in love when you're looking in someone's eyes, they're telling you about their life, they're telling you things they haven't even, re they haven't told anybody else. And once they're through telling that story, their entire family, all of their friends can now share in their life and they have it down, and it's now history, and it's just their story. How can you not fall in love when someone opens up their heart, and not only their heart, their soul, and you're looking in their eyes, and they're telling you about their life. Instant love, instant love. And what it's done for me is, when I'm gone, my sons and my Susan will have hundreds of hours where they can just say and look and say, wow, dad talked to, look at dad, look at dad. I'll always be there. And I'll always be there with the people I love. So what could be better? You're talking to someone you love and the people you love are watching you do that. Joe's favorite songs. Um, we're going to end shortly with um, a lovely song from Deirdre, who's been here the whole time playing piano for us. Thank you so much, Deirdre, for being here. Um, and yay! Um, I wanted to share that we are going to be naming the voiceover booth at MPTF Studios for Joe. Um, and you know, it, it will be a, a small beginning way that we will continue Joe's legacy here at Channel 22. How pretty that is. Nice. That's <clears throat> nice. We love it. <clears throat> thank um, you, Jennifer, for uh, bringing us all together. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. You're very much. Yeah. Michael, would you like to say anything as we hand it over to a little nod of tip of the hat to the cowboy that your dad always wanted to be with his cap gun at the hitching post. <laughs> just to say, um, you know, do good and be good. And just like my dad said, you know, just, uh, just put that energy out to the universe and keep doing what Joe did. Love you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Remember the hugs. Lovely to meet you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.